Hello, my name is Paul Waltz, and I'm here to discuss, uh, today I'm here to discuss uh, BVD virus and Zika virus. Uh, Zika virus has emerged as a very significant pathogen, particularly in pregnant women. Um, in BVD virus uh, is very similar to Zika virus in some of its pathogenesis, so in this regard it serves as a very good model for Zika virus infections. Uh, let's begin with the, uh, the viruses and the genomes and the organization. Uh, both Zika virus and BVD virus are members of the family Flaviviridae. Um, the family Flaviviridae is consisted of viruses that have a single-stranded positive sense RNA genome. Basically what this means is that the viral RNA acts as messenger RNA, so that message, message is uh, immediately translated into protein. Uh, the family Flaviviridae is separated into four distinct genera. Uh, they include the, the genus Flavivirus, the genus Papacivirus, the genus Pestivirus, and the genus Pegivirus. Uh, of most, arguably of most importance is the genus Flavivirus. This virus has the greatest number of viral species among the Flaviviridae family. Um, these viruses are mainly viruses that uh, cause disease in humans and animal, animal populations. There's greater than 60 viruses or viral species that will actually cause infection in human and animal species. These flaviviruses are segregated into two distinct groups. There's the tick-borne viral group and the mosquito-borne viral group. The mosquito-borne viral group has the majority of the species within this particular genus and it includes yellow fever virus. Now the yellow fever virus is the virus, it's the prototype virus of the genus Flavivirus. Um, the genus and the family got its name from the yellow fever virus. Flavus in Latin means yellow, and that's how that, uh, that the significance of that name. Also in those mosquito-borne viruses are the viruses that are of importance. So dengue fever virus is uh, a very important virus. It causes dengue shock syndrome as well as dengue hemorrhagic fever in people. Zika virus infection, which we're going to talk about. West Nile virus. These are all viruses of major human importance. The next genus is the Apace virus genus, and the prototype virus in this group is the hepatitis C virus. This is a virus also that has a uh, worldwide distribution creates tremendous problems in the human population. The hepatitis C virus actually can be separated into six different gene groups, but in recent years we've identified further members of this genus, and so currently there are six species in the genus Hepacivirus, um, and they also include two newly recognized species in veterinary medicine, including the equine Hepacivirus and the canine Hepacivirus. The genus Pestivirus, this is the group that we all know and love because BVD virus is the prototype virus in this group. There are four distinct species of viruses in the Pestivirus genus. BVD1 and BVD2 have their own distinct species recognition along with border disease virus and classical swine fever virus. There are other viruses that have not been given their own species designation yet. They are distinct viruses genetically and likely in the future we'll see some of these will, will achieve the status of having their own species. The newest genera in the group of Flaviviridae is the Pegivirus genus, and this is a group that is very recent. Um, it includes several GB viruses which were uh, isolated from a human patient uh, defined as GB, but of interest too is, is several new recognized species within this genus, and that includes the equine pegivirus and the Thyler's disease associated virus. Both of these viruses are found in horses, and they are very similar to hepatitis C in their distribution and infection in that they cause liver problems. The Thyler's disease associated virus is also so, uh, termed serum sickness virus or serum hepatitis virus. So this virus is associated with blood transfusions in horses, creating a, a hepatic syndrome. So even though these viruses, we group them by, uh, we group them in their different genera based upon the genetic sequences, they're also grouped together by their biology. And this is why it's important for veterinary practitioners to understand some of the taxonomy, because these viruses have a distinct genetic grouping 
but they also have a biological significance within their grouping. For example, the genus Pessivirus includes only the viruses that are really of, of agricultural importance. It doesn't include any uh, per human pathogens per se. The genus Pessivirus and the genus Pegivirus, both of those genera, include viruses that create hepatic disease. And then the genus Flavivirus is grouped together because they are the arboviral group. And so those are the viral group that is transmitted by our, by our insects. So next, let's look a little bit at the individual genomes associated with this virus. And on this slide, you'll see that I've got uh, the three different uh, major groups there, the pestivirus group on the top, the pestivirus group in the middle, and then the flavivirus group on the bottom. All of these viruses, these single-stranded positive sense RNA viruses, really only need two structures to survive. They need a capsid, which provides that protection, and then they need a RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which is that NS5B that we have in the Apace and the Pesci group, and then the NS5 that's located there in the Flavi group. Other than that, most of the other proteins that are utilized are utilized for uh, either recognition of the cell surface uh, receptor, or they involve proteases or cleavage enzymes or uh, enzymes that assist in the replication or the translation of the viral proteins. You can see there that the pestivirus does have the largest ge genome of the Flaviviridae group, and so it has uh, over 12 kilobases in length, translates over 4,000 amino acids. As you see from all of these groups, they have a five prime and three prime non-coded regions. Uh, the five prime non-coded region is, is the area that's responsible for ribosome attachment to create that polyprotein, so all three of them have a five prime non-coded region, but the Pacey viruses and the Pesci viruses are very much alike in how they have that five prime non-translated region or non-coding region. The three prime non-coded region, non region is utilized for the RNA replication. But the five prime non-coded region is very important for the Pesci viruses because this is how we have defined the different species, so the BVD1 and the BVD2, when we talk about differentiating them by group, that's often the area that's, that's looked at from a molecular standpoint. If you look at the Pacey viruses, they're the smallest group there. Uh, they have the most similarity uh, to the Pesty viruses and the BVD in, in particular. The Flavy viruses seem to be a little bit different. Uh, the flaviviruses within that group will differ substantially, so the tick-borne encephal tick group has a longer three-prime untranslated region than the, uh, than the mosquito group, so they, there are some differences in their genetic code. But again, BVD is very important, and, and the reason it is important because it has two very unique types of protein. The N-pro is the uh, N-terminal protease. That's a very unique protein associated with BVD virus, as well as the ERNS, which is an envelope glycoprotein, and, it's, and the RNS stands for ribonuclease secreted. So it has important functions um, as it relates to the cell and the host. All right, so here, let's get into a little bit more of the discussion of BVD virus, which is the Pesci virus, and Zika virus, which is the Flavivirus. Both of these viruses were discovered in the 1940s. Um, Olufsen, in 1946, as well as Childs in 1946, both described this virus simultaneously here in the United States and in Canada. Um, the Zika virus was first reported in the early 1950s, but it was based upon an infection that occurred in 1947. Uh, that first report involved uh, an infection or a recognition of an infection in the Zika forest. That's how the virus got its name. The Zika forest is located in Central Africa near Uganda. The Zika forest is interesting because it's only a 60-acre forest, but it has the greatest biodiversity or the greatest diversity of mosquito populations in the world. If you look at the primary host, BVD virus has cattle as its primary host, but we also see that BVD virus is not host restricted. This virus is capable of creating infections in a lot of our other artiodactyls, including white-tailed deer, sheep, goats, pigs. And so of the pesty viruses, BVD is the least host restricted, so it, it, it can create infection and pathology in other species. 
If you look at the primary host for Zika virus, it's mainly the monkey. The rhesus monkey is the primary host. Of course, secondary hosts will involve humans um, and can involve other animal hosts. There are several reports of seropositive goats and sheep. And so there is some question as to whether Zika virus is not entirely host restricted either. The primary route of transmission with BVD virus, we, we know that the primary route is through direct contact, mainly with the population maintenance, which is the persistently infected carrier. Um, versus Zika virus, uh, the primary route of transmission is through the arboviral vector, the mosquitoes, and the Aedes aegypti is the predominant mosquito that's associated with transmission of Zika virus. Zika virus is unique in that it does go through a sylvatic cycle, and what the sylvatic cycle is basically the endemic cycle, which is the proportion of time that the pathogen is between the vector and its resident host. Where we're starting to see the epidemic, or why we have an epidemic with Zika virus, is because the sylvatic cycle has called a spillover into an epidemic or an epizootic cycle, and the epidemic cycle has is, is resulted in infections in humans. The clinical manifestations is a real key feature. So the clinical manifestations are quite similar, which is why BVD virus and Zika virus behave biologically very similar in their infected host. Both of them result in a high degree of subclinical infections. It's estimated that 90% or greater of BVD viral infections are subclinical. It's estimated that 80% or greater of Zika virus infections are subclinical. Now, Zika virus does not create dead-end hosts in humans. And what is a dead-end host? A dead-end host is where a virus gets into the host but cannot replicate in a sufficient level to result in transmission. Of the flaviviruses, dengue, yellow fever, and Zika are the only three viruses where when they replicate in humans, they don't create a dead-end host situation. So those three viruses, um, as opposed to West Nile virus, where humans are dead-end hosts, those three viruses will replicate and can result in transmissions through the mosquito to other humans. And so that's, that's an important feature. But again, both of these viral infections create a subclinical type of disease. So the global distribution, uh, yes, it is global. BVD virus is endemic in most of our cattle populations across the world. And then if you look at Zika virus, Zika virus is mainly confined to areas that have the vector. But because of our world travel, um, the Zika virus can get out of those certain areas and actually can get into other mosquito species that can result in transmission. So let's, let's focus a little bit on transmission and persistence. So with BVD virus, we, we totally understand that the persistent infected carrier is a major reservoir of the virus, and most of our herd infections are the result of acquisition of a persistently infected carrier. Persistent infected carrier cattle certainly uh, don't live as long as normal cattle, but there are many instances of PI cattle that have lived multiple years and can result in transmission to other cattle uh, that uh, acutely infected or transiently infected animals can certainly also be a source of transmission, albeit to a much lesser level than what PI animals are. But the real feature is that these persistently infected carriers, when they are put in contact with susceptible cows, pregnant cows, that can result in the generation of new generations of persistently infected calves. The Zika virus, uh, of course, we've talked about, goes through a sylvatic cycle. And so the, the, the rhesus monkey is the primary host for this. So the virus will circulate between the rhesus monkey and the mosquito population. But then it will spill over into human populations. And in human populations, like I referred to previously, uh, we do not see a dead-end host situation, so human-to-human -human transmission through mosquitoes is a, another major route of transmission. Other types of transmission occur and are similar between both BVD virus and Zika virus. We can have transmission through saliva, through nasal passages, through urine, and also sexual transmission is, is a feature of both Zika virus transmission and BVD virus transmission as well.
So one of the things that has really uh, made it BBD virus and Zika virus as important and similar pathogens is what's referred to as congenital BBDV and Zika, Zika virus syndrome. Um, the outcome of fetal infection associated with both of these viral pathogens is highly dependent upon three main factors. The gestational age of the fetus at the time of infection, the organ system that is involved in the infection, and the properties of the virus, whether it relates to virulence or target cell population. And we know from our work with BVD virus that there are certain viral strains or viral populations that are much more virulent to a fetus than what other viral strains or populations are. A common feature that we see with congenital BVDV and Zika virus syndrome is the ability to affect the nervous system tissues. And the nervous system tissue has been a, a very a, a large focus of study on Zika virus, but there are other similar features that they share with this congenital syndrome, including uh, growth retardation, uh, effects on fetal immune system function. And so the old saying that a, a viral infection of a de developing fetus is benign is, is certainly not the case with either of these viral pathogens. The other interesting part when we compare BVD virus and Zika virus congenital syndromes, the virus can persist in fetal tissues. We know that viral persistence in cattle is through the process of persistent infection, but in some of the studies with Zika virus, the virus can persist in brain tissue and other tissues that may be either immunoprivileged or where immune system function is not to the full level that a, a postnatal uh, human would be. When we compare the congenital defects of the central nervous system associated with BVD virus and Zika virus, microcephaly um, is a feature of both of those. One feature that's been reported in the literature with Zika virus are brain calcifications. And so brain calcifications is the most common feature associated with infection of the, of the central nervous system associated with Zika virus. Cerebellar hypoplasia seems to be a feature that we see uh, quite frequently with BVD virus infection of the developing calf fetus. Um, and certainly that's something that's also observed in Zika virus infection, albeit at a, a lesser level or a lesser incidence than what we see it with BVD. But you can see the list. There's other, other features that are very common between the two, hydrocephalus and ventricular megaly. Uh, those are features that are associated with both. And we can also see uh, widespread depletion of the various structures of the cerebrum and the cerebellum. What's not nearly, uh, what's, what's not as well known about Zika virus is what happens at different stages of pregnancy. This is an area that we have invested a, a lot of effort and we have a better understanding of what may happen with congenital defects and other aspects of the infection in the developing fetus associated with BVD virus. When BVD virus affects the early developing embryo, uh, embryo loss is something that's uh, observed. Uh, fetal death and expulsion of that developing fetus can occur at any time during gestation when it's associated with BVD virus. And this is another uh, very important feature of Zika virus. Miscarriages are a very uh, common report associated with Zika virus infection as well. What is really unique about BVD virus is this immunotolerance. And so when the virus infects the developing fetus during the period of immune system development, the virus is thought to be recognized as a self-antigen, and therefore the developing fetus and subsequent calf is considered immunotolerant and persistently infected. This is a feature that seems to be exclusive of BVD. There's very, very few and poorly defined examples of this immunotolerance with other viral species and with other infections in other animal species. With Zika virus, what's observed is this prolonged infection that occurs in the fetus, mainly in the brain tissue, and uh, that may be a feature that's of immunotolerance that's not nearly as well described as what we see with BVD. Of course, congenital defects usually occur in the, in the middle part of gestation when these organs are being developed and that's where we see the cerebral and cerebellar defects associated with BVD virus infection. 
And then lastly, when we have calves that are infected or fetuses that are infected in late gestation, uh, we often think that they're seropositive and they may be normal or abnormal. There are some data out there that would suggest that fetuses that are infected in late gestation do not have the same immune function and growth rates. And so, again, there's, it's, it's unlikely that these viral infections of a developing fetus are truly benign without consequence. So let's talk a little bit about the challenges associated with each of these viruses. Um, the challenges associated with BVD virus control are, are quite numerous, and that's the reason why this virus has become a major animal agricultural problem, it's a worldwide problem. One of the main features is that the virus creates this subclinical infection. So these unobserved infections in the dam uh, can result in the persistence of virus in the offspring. These persistently infected carriers then with our segmentation and movement of our cattle populations can then travel throughout different parts of the, of the country or the community and create infections in other populations. The other thing that makes control very difficult, it's difficult to identify the virus in a population of cattle. There's been literature to look at this, and when you look at the herd descriptions of, of having the virus or not having the virus, the only thing that really shows a significant difference is the proportion of adult cattle that are pregnant. All of the other criteria, calf morbidity, calf mortality, um, overall herd reproduction, when you look at herds that had the virus versus herds that don't, it's difficult to pinpoint. And so that makes that, uh, that diagnosis quite difficult. Another major problem is the genomic and antigenic diversity. Because both Zika virus and BVD virus are RNA, single-stranded positive sense RNA viruses, their polymerase has very, very poor proofreading activity. And so as a result of the generation of, of new viruses during an infectious cycle, um, mutants are developed and the term quasi-species or this, this multitude of different viruses that are within a population uh, does occur. The other challenge associated with BVD control is that we have had vaccines for decades and we know that our vaccination programs are not 100% protective, although they get very close to that. Uh, we do have very safe and efficacious vaccines when they're applied properly, but in general it's not a 100% protective effect. The challenges that we have associated with Zika virus control, again this is a major public health problem. As it stands today, there are no vaccines or antiviral drugs that are available to protect or treat infected patients with Zika virus. Another major problem associated with control is that Zika virus is transmitted by the same mosquitoes as other flaviviruses, including dengue. And a dengue viral infection will look very similar to a Zika virus infection. Both of these infections can be subclinical, and that makes control and diagnosis quite difficult. It's unknown the role of other routes of transmission, whether it be nasal, sexual, saliva, or urine routes of transmission. We know that with BVD virus, direct transmission from PIs to susceptible animals is the major route, and then it becomes an issue of partitioning the risk. In human populations where we have this global epidemic, we need to understand all routes of transmission to stop the cycle of infection. The other challenge associated with Zika virus control is the prolonged viremia in pregnant females. Um, as you can imagine, the longer a patient is viremic, the more likely for a mosquito to pick up that infection and transmit it to the next susceptible host. And so that's another real challenge associated with control of the virus. And then finally, uh, why this virus became an epidemic all of a sudden uh, likely had to do with the importation of this virus through global travel. So most of the disease that we have seen in areas outside of Brazil and Southeast Asia have been the result of the importation of the virus through this global travel. And as you can see here, and this is, this is interesting because when you look at Zika virus, um, uh, travel patterns have really allowed this pathogen to reach nearly every place on Earth. And you could take a small snapshot of different areas on the globe 
where cattle are doing the same sort of transportation and movement. So if you would focus in on the United States as an example, because of the segmentation and movement of our cattle industry, we have quite a few animals that are moving about the country that are persistently infected with this virus. And that, like Zika virus, is a, a, a major uh, control point that we can't easily address. So let's uh, briefly talk about vaccinations. In order for the vaccines to be effective, whether it be for BVD virus or Zika virus, we need the vaccines to be not only safe, but also efficacious. So the requirements for our vaccines, they gotta protect against all strains of the virus. And we know that again, with our RNA dependent RNA polymerase, we have tremendous genetic diversity with each replication cycle. And that viral change results in an antigenic diversity. And so our vaccines have to take that into account and protect against all of those strains. The vaccines have to be safe for the pregnancy. So a Zika virus vaccine must be safe for a, for a pregnancy. BVD virus vaccine should be safe for the pregnancy as well. The immune responses generated by the both, both vaccines should induce a systemic and a genital immune response such that the virus can be stopped uh, prior to creating the deleterious effects on the fetus. And then the other point is that the virus or the vaccines sh should lack transmission and so this is a very important part of Zika virus vaccine development is that when these vaccines are to become available, it's important that vaccinated individuals are not allowed to uh, transmit the vaccine strains through, va through the mosquito population. So on the right here, we have our classic vaccines and our, our ideal vaccine in terms of what these properties should offer. Modified live vaccines, of, of course, are, are able to replicate. They're able to stimulate uh, cell-mediated immune responses. Um, our modified live vaccines have both a potential bio-risk as well as an envir environmental risk, meaning that modified live vaccines can create problems in the animal that's being vaccinated if it's immunosuppressed or stressed or in poor condition. And it can also serve as an environmental risk because our modified live vaccines can be shed to other populations or other animals within the population. In contrast, our kill vaccines are generally regarded as safe because they do not replicate, they, they aren't shed. Um, they are more apt to generate a humoral moon response. Um, one of the disadvantages when we, when we think about basic immunization or the primary and booster injections um, certainly our killed viral vaccines need multiple doses to achieve an immune response. So right in between is the ideal vaccine. We would like to have a vaccine that is able to replicate, to generate both arms of the immune system, both humoral and cell-mediated immunity, but is safe in that it doesn't shed, doesn't create problems, uh, doesn't pose a bio-risk or an environmental risk um, when it is used. The Zika virus vaccines we know are likely to be successful and there are data to demonstrate this. So when uh, a person is infected with a, a Zika virus or in some of the experimental data on, on uh, the rhesus monkeys, they are immune to a, an immune, uh, to a re-challenge or a reinfection. Um, therefore, the immune response is generated to a Zika virus um, infection will protect against a reinfection. And we know from years and years of data and a recent meta-analysis was published that BVD vaccines, when used appropriately, are very efficacious in reducing the level of reproductive problems associated with this virus. As our scientific community has gained more knowledge, new vaccine strategies and technologies have become available to enhance the safety and immunity profile against BVD virus, and hopefully these same attributes can be utilized for Zika virus infections and other viruses that are located within the family Viridae. So to summarize, we've talked a little bit about BVD virus and Zika virus as related to the virus, um, as, as well as related to the transmission, the pathogenesis, because of their similarities, not only in their genetic code, but as well as their transmission and pathogenesis, they, they really share 
tremendous similarities. And when we talk about what's very important is how do we control both of these viral pathogens, they really involve three major principles. One of them is to eliminate the reservoir, and this is effectively done by identifying and removing persistently infected cattle that are infected with BVD virus. When we talk about Zika virus, eliminating the mosquito reservoir is a very important aspect. And there's been some work with uh, uh, different uh, species of Aedes aegypti that have been modulated, uh, and this allows uh, a diminished or, a, or a, a lack of virus associated with this population of transmissible mosquitoes. The next is to prevent infection in susceptible hosts through enhancement of immunity. Um, we have tremendous diversity of BVD vaccines on the market and we have shown that they are safe and efficacious to use, and so we have that covered. Zika virus, currently there are three vaccines that are being advanced for clinical uh, trials, and so these are in development, and they should be available here hopefully soon. And then finally, the, the area that I think uh, can make a, a big difference, especially with Zika virus, and an area that we, I think, can, can do a little bit better job in terms of BVD virus control is biosecurity specifically biosecurity associated with the developing fetus. That's when uh, intense biosecurity should be employed when we talk about Zika vi uh, BVD virus, excuse me. But that's also uh, the lessons that we learned from BVD virus control can also be applied to Zika virus control. So pregnant women should uh, not be exposed to potential pathogens in, in, if it's unnecessary. As you can see, Zika virus and BVD virus are two very important pathogens. Uh, I thank you for your attention and your time. We certainly have a, a long way to go in controlling uh, both of these pathogens in our animal and human populations. Thank you.